Welcome to the Staying Free podcast. This podcast seeks to give a voice to real people around the world who are attempting to stay free, stay sovereign, and stay sane in a world which is changing faster than ever. In this episode, I talk with Anna Rayner. Anna returned from Hong Kong after the Chinese began their notorious crackdown on the region's political autonomy and is now a dedicated freedom fighter, working with both Heart and the Together Declaration to help prevent the UK from falling to authoritarianism like the country she recently left. I hope you enjoy this conversation, and if you have any feedback or suggestions for interesting guests, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. A link is in the show notes. On to the episode. Anna, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I've been following you on Twitter for a while, and you've been, been putting some really good takes out there. So, uh, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. So Anna, I don't really know too much about you aside from um, the kind of stuff you've been putting out on Twitter. So I'm interested to know kind of how you got involved in the whole kind of, or I guess the freedom movement. Um, like what's the origin story there? Um, when did things start not making sense to you or, or kind of what's your story in the past couple of years? Well, it's quite a long story, I suppose. Um, <laughs> I had quite a unique take on COVID in the beginning because we were living in Hong Kong as it broke out. So when they were first panicking about it, we were just moving back to UK. And um, we'd also witnessed how SARS-1 had taken hold there and had, they'd never quite recovered. So because that was a kind of epicenter of SARS-1, this paranoia about germs and disease and viruses and the masking up on, you know, of people was still there 20 years later in a kind of, well, however many, I think it was 17 years later, or whatever it was, in a really superstitious kind of way, which seemed really odd to us coming in as outsiders. Because it's like, huh, they're really still worried about, you know, catching things and dying, even though the numbers, I think, were tiny then. And um, so, yeah, we were planning to move back from the UK, uh, from Hong Kong to the UK. And um, there was a time lag. So I moved back first with the kids. And then my husband was still stuck in Hong Kong through um, some of the early parts of the pandemic, sort of reporting stuff there. And we're both kind of numbers people. So um, I was kind of looking at the Diamond Princess ship early doors because um I thought, well, that's that's an amazing kind of experiment in one sense that they're trapped on this thing for weeks. We can get some amazing data about whether it's a worry or not. You know, I was kind of not at all um, aware of some of the more what I think um, malign intentions at that point. I just thought, OK, it's another virus outbreak. And then I saw that it didn't really look like anything to panic about. You know, um, the cruise ship was full of old people. Very few people um, died in that period, perhaps a kind of relatively um, normal amount, actually, in terms of octogenarians and people in their 70s. It wasn't anything kind of extraordinary. And then I saw the videos coming out of China and I thought, oh, dear, <laughs> we're not actually believing this, are we? Because obviously when you live near China, um, particularly living in Hong Kong, who are very suspicious of um, some of the things around Chinese totalitarianism and propaganda, you get the idea that you obviously don't trust anything that comes out of China. Of course, they're not telling the truth. And I looked at these videos and I thought, that's insane. Um, so I was very surprised. And I just, it was like watching a slow motion car crash. I was like, what are people doing talking about locking down? This is insane. It's a virus. You don't lock healthy people away. It's a respiratory virus. And because I'd come from, um, so I um, was a practicing homeopath. So I have a good idea about um, the immune system and how these things work. And it just seemed like everyone had thrown everything they ever knew about disease out of the window and started to believe in, in magical thinking and, and healthy people spread disease. And uh, we've got to lock everyone away and copy China and now copy Italy. And, you know, I just watched this thing turn into something that seemed utterly insane. And then I started to panic because I thought we're going down a very dark path here. And, you know, then they started shutting schools and all the rest of it. Um, and I just couldn't get to grips with what was going on because at that point I didn't see a more kind of uh, conspiratorial edge to it, which, you know, as time's gone on, I think you'd have to be some sort of coincidentalist not to think there are elements of this that are very um, planned. Um, 
So, yeah, so because we were stuck in lockdown, you know, we obsessively started looking at data and the ONS figures and all the rest of it. And I just could not see the narrative matching up with what I was seeing in the reality. Um, And I could see some fairly rational explanations for why there was this spike in deaths, you know, with old people in care homes, moving sick people into care homes, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. So then I joined Twitter because it turns out not many of our friends felt the same way. (laughs) So um, I was kind of desperate to find like-minded people. And I joined Twitter and uh, uh, someone put a call out, you know, does anyone want to join a Zoom to talk about this stuff? And through that, I started building networks of people and um, other people that were worried about the direction of travel. And so it kind of went from there, really. Um, But I was very, very clear early on that that everything was all wrong. It just felt all wrong. Something something felt not right from day one. And it felt like propaganda was a real key theme, I think, with the Chinese stuff and then latterly everyone. (laughs) So, yeah, that was that's a rough synopsis. So how long were you in Hong Kong before leaving there? So we were there for about three years. Um, and in that time, we probably had the very last bit of the real glory days of Hong Kong before there was suddenly this acceleration of the takeover. So, you know, it was supposed to be a 50 year plan. And then suddenly the democracy laws were just kind of wiped away. People were kind of disappeared. Um, and there was rioting and protesting for months on end. And you just saw the power of China when China says that's what we're doing that's what they're doing and the kind of the feeling of the local Hong Kongese kind of people that the Hong Kongers didn't want that encroachment you know they very much see themselves a separate place with a separate identity so yeah it was it was kind of just very jarring watching that what felt like just a a takeover basically an invasion Um, and so we kind of just the age our kids were as well we just wanted to get back to Europe and um and set resettle there in time for secondary schools and things like that yeah I think that was probably a wise decision and you mentioned SARS do you know if there was any lockdowns for SARS I don't actually I would have said um Probably not, although they they kind of are quite militant in sort of the track and tracey type stuff. So they would have probably identified sources quite quickly. Um, I haven't read a, a great deal on that that particular outbreak, but I know that it it was not what it was touted to be at the time either. So a lot of figures were were bandied about like thirty um, percent mortality and stuff. That latterly I think has turned out to be nonsense but um i don't know in great detail a lot about sars1 just that it was another example of this kind of explosion of fear and an absolute panic and you know hong kong was deserted i think for a period of time um and, and then it just kind of frittered away yeah definitely i mean and as you were saying with these videos that were coming out of china of people just kind of dropping dead i mean they they just look so obviously fake and the fact that the media kind of reported on these deaths and you can still see these articles now you can you can go back into the archives and see the articles about these people who are supposedly dropping dead from this virus and they're just so fake and i don't know how they publish this stuff with a straight face i mean obviously because you lived in hong kong and you know presumably had an understanding of what the chinese were like and a, a kind of natural suspicion being in that region um i mean <laughs> But looking at these things now, they're just so obviously fake. And the fact that the media has not put any kind of retractions out, I've yet to see a single retraction where they've said, oh, hey, by the way, you know, this stuff that we were putting out about people just just dropping dead that looks very obviously acted, you know, we were fooled. The fact that they've just not said anything really tells you all you need to know about the media. Well, the media, I think none of this would have been possible. None of where we are now would have been possible without their um, commitment to lying for the past 20 months. You know, Um, I would say, yeah, I that's the bit that really bugged me for months. Actually, I knew China was lying, but I also suspected that America would know China was lying. You know, like these are not kind of allied countries, even though, you know, Chinese money is everywhere now. But I couldn't understand this notion that 
they would allow China to come and destroy the economy in 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 the US. That didn't make any sense to me. And you know, I was following people like uh, Michael Senger, who I thought was brilliant about the whole. Um, it well, it still is brilliant about the whole Chinese thing. But where I disagree with him slightly is that they're the belly of the beast. I don't think they are. I think that the powers that be in America understood that the financial system was about to implode. And they recognized the Chinese system as the central bank digital currency type set up with UBI and all of that was a way that they could perhaps sort of segue onto a system where they got to keep the control. But they would desperately need some disaster in order to confuse and panic people in order to make that happen. So I don't tend to see China as as the, the, the enemy, although I very much suspect they will be scapegoated very shortly. Um, I think that that will be part of the script where suddenly it will be like, oh, this is all China's fault. Whereas I think I don't I think it's much more complicated than that. And I actually tend to think that the belly of the beast is more the American financial system, um, the Federal Reserve type shadowy figures, those kind of um, players, because otherwise it doesn't make sense to me. There's no way that that Tony Fauci is kind of doing gain of function research with China, thinking we can trust these guys, you know, like it just none of that makes any sense. They're doing it for their ends. They know exactly what they're doing It's planned. Event 201, the whole thing, you know, it, it's very clear to me that this wasn't just a by accident kind of event. It, it seems that there was so, there's so much evidence that, um, that points to otherwise, you know, so I'm not someone that, I, I also really worry about this word conspiracy theorist because um, I notice that when you think about yourself, as soon as something seems like it could be conspiratorial, your instinct is to shut that thought down. I thought, huh, that's clever. <laughs> you know, um, I've I've actually I've got a background in psychology, so my my first degree was in psychology. So we learned a lot about that kind of thing. You know, about um, how to how to manipulate thoughts. And I remember doing segments on propaganda and that kind of thing. Um, so it, it just worried me. You know, the shutting down, the censorship. Um, at the same time, I've been worried about that in general in society, you know, watching this culture of self-censorship, which I think is partially a result of um, tech where everything's recorded. Nothing's um, you can't make a mistake because your your whole um, character or career or whatever could could disappear if you get it wrong. And it's um, indelible, you know. So I'm. I don't know. I just I found the whole thing quite worrying. It felt like a kind of Russia circa 1950 type mood, you know, and um, that's not sort of somewhere that I wanted my kids to end up sort of having to live. So that's where I sort of became very keen to reach out to other people that felt like minded, partly for my insanity, but also because I think it's really important. I think the worry is not many people care they're just getting on with their life you know they're trying to make trying to get by trying to feed feed yourself look after the kids you know do all the things that life demands and i think that unfortunately this kind of disaster you only really realize when it's a bit too late so i wanted to get involved with trying to raise awareness about it yeah i totally agree um i think for many of us it has become such an important issue and you know sometimes I'm sure that my kind of friends and family think that I've gone crazy because I'm spending so much time occupying myself with this stuff and you know obviously even things like starting this podcast has been largely because I saw that there was a I want to feel like I'm doing more you know I want to feel like I'm doing everything I can because I can see I feel like I'm looking down the barrel of a gun and if I'm not putting my best efforts into doing something just something within um, my abilities using my my skill set and the, the skills that are available to me to to try to kind of combat this thing then I know that I will uh, live in regret because you know um, I want to know that I've kind of played my part and I'm sure that's a feeling that a lot of people feel and actually I think is uh, is definitely being seen now I've noticed that a lot of people are getting creative and putting their kind of talents to use to do what they can to try to kind of um, you know steer the ship in the right direction so to speak yeah, I really, I think it's been really heartening, actually. So one of the kind of upsides of the last 20 months is meeting so many absolutely brilliant people. Um, I feel really lucky, actually, for that. I, I've really enjoyed 
just and the breadth of people as well from all different walks of life, all different ages, all different um, careers, you know, which I've never I wouldn't have got the opportunity to kind of cross paths with them were it not for what's happened. And it does feel like building a network of people who are going to hold the line because, you know, for some of us, this is not it's just not something we're prepared to bow down to. So um, it's whatever is option B is the thing. And I don't mean plan B, but, you know, um, it, it's just not happening. My, you know, I'm not saying yes to this. I'm not joining the merry-go-round of jabs every six months in exchange for your freedom. I mean, this is insanity. You know, I'm just surprised that more people aren't awake to it and shouting loudly about it now, especially watching what's going on in, in Austria and Germany and Italy. I mean, you know, the home of fascism. And now here we are again, uh, shutting out sections of society because they are unclean. I mean, you know, yeah. it's, it's quite frightening. I mean, this is, this is no coincidence, you know, it's not, it's not, it would be an unbelievable coincidence for the three kind of pillar nations of um, fascism 1.0 to be the countries doing fascism 2.0 and for people to look at that and go oh well that's not fascism it's like well it that would be an unbelievable coincidence that the exact same three countries um that kind of it stemmed from the first time that it's stemming from those countries again so like either an unbelievable coincidence is taking place or there's something in the blood over there i don't know what it is there's something in you know i'm not saying obviously it's in the people over there but there's something in the national psyche maybe that they just seem to have more of a propensity for this stuff because it's so weird isn't it it's so weird i'm sure they want to bring this stuff in here but i think that they would have a much harder time i really think that um Yes, we're seeing protests over there now, and it's good to see. Actually, to be fair, I think Germany has been very weak on this. It's nice to see Austria starting to stand up now, and Italy has been has been great. Italy, Italy's been very strong. Yeah, but if they try to bring that here, I think that they would they would see a massive, massive movement. Which I uh, hope so. I don't give huge amount of credit to the UK, but I will give give credit for that to the people here. Yeah, although I was slightly alarmed with just how easily they just rolled in vaccine passports in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. You know, obviously there are very small groups that are trying to push back against that. But people don't seem to care, which is because I think human nature is, well, that's all right, I've got my jabs. I think when people will start to care is when their jabs expire. And they're like, oh, hang on a minute. I, I didn't realise this was going to be a kind of subscription-based service, you know. Um, so I suspect with each round, I, I feel like they, they're, as a friend of mine says, they bet the farm and I think they're going too fast and the wheels are falling off, actually. That's my sense. I'm not hopeless at all because um, I think they've really misjudged human nature in a way that billionaire psychopaths maybe do misjudge human beings that have empathy of hearts and, and, you know, can experience caring about other people and things like that. Um, because I, I just don't see it going very well. There's too many injuries for a start. I don't think they were intending for there to be that many adverse events and, and that kind of thing. Um, and the truth leaks out through social media for our kind of side in in the same way as it does for them. So they can't stem the the bleeding on the truth just kind of leaking out in a way that in in days gone by that wouldn't have been possible. I wouldn't have had access to all of these amazing channels of of truth seeking information once you're ready to to open your your mind to it. I think the difficulty I'm having is I think the the biggest obstacle we have in this country is actually what I would class as the the educated class, like the you know the quite highly educated um, people with who they're fond of their own intellect and their ability to assess information, and they can't um, conceive of a world where they may have been tricked or or um, misled, or where their favourite Guardian newspaper has been um, hijacked by uh, financial interests or pharmaceutical interests. Um, and I just don't think that, that they can't break that trust bond between their trusted news source and the stuff that's coming out of it. Whereas I think I broke the habit of watching telly when I moved out of the UK when I was 20 and I never really got that habit back again. And I do think the TV is the biggest, strongest weapon they have. People still habitually sit down and watch the news. They're hearing the radio. It's a constant onslaught of, of propaganda, basically. So you have to be quite um, 
sure of yourself uh, and when it's going on all around you and you're in this tiny minority you really have to have quite a, a sort of strong will to to not succumb to the group thing because it's behaving like a cult but the cult is the majority so it's a very unusual um situation to find ourselves in um because we're we're the ones that didn't join the cult necessarily, but uh, we're in a tiny minority, or I don't know how tiny. Hopefully not tiny. Hopefully bigger than I think. I agree completely with everything you just said. It is um, a cult. Um, I do think that we are in a strange point in history whereby normally we are used to cults being the minority. Um, and in this particular case, the cult is the majority, but it's not unique in history. It, it it's obviously happens at strange points in history, but it's not the first time because you could argue that the exact same thing happened, um, you know, in places, you know, communists, I guess something like Maoist China would be an example, um, you know, Nazi Germany would be an example. You know, most people just went along, um, you know, some obviously more with more kind of vigor than others, but you know, it's perfectly possible for something to sweep over society. And, you know, there's a kind of arrogance going around that probably has been around for a while where people say, oh, well, you know, um, what happened then wouldn't happen now. We're, we're far smarter than that. You know, we're, we're too smart. We wouldn't be like those, uh, like those people. You know, we wouldn't be like the, the Nazis or we wouldn't be like um, the people in Stalinist uh, Russia or whatever it is. And um, actually, I think that people are just as susceptible, if not more so, because there's probably a higher degree of trust in governments now than there was even during those times. I think that's bang on. And also, I, I think the other thing is they've weaponized the phone that you're strapped to from the second people wake up to the second they go, you know, it's like you've got a weapon basically in your hands all day long that they are literally brainwashing you with. And yes, I mean, the number of arguments, well, let, let's call them debates, <laughs> I've had with them. Um, friends where you know they've said that that exact phrase that can never happen here it's like that's such a dangerous premise you know freedom and democracy is is baby young really in in the history of mankind mostly we've lived in horrible sort of feudal societies and things like that you know so um to be that blase about it the only reason we have it is because people fought for it and and it really needs to be looked after and they seemed i think the other kind of shock to me was the judiciary seems to be completely broken corrupt i mean you know if you i guess if you are incredibly powerful and have all the money you can afford to put people in those positions who will do your bidding. And it became very apparent to me that there's an entire network of people, you know, that have been placed in positions of power through delightful organizations like the WEF. You know, if you go to their young leaders program, there they all are, you know, all of the current um, worst protagonists in this, um, Jacinda and 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 uh, Macron and all the rest of them, you know, they they all passed through this organisation that I think has some very dodgy foundations. Um, so it, it does seem, yes, it's a conspiracy to me. You know that it it doesn't seem far fetched because. When I look at the evidence, that's what I see in front of me. And if that makes me mad, then so be it. But I'm I'm not capable of just going along with the other narrative. It's just not in my DNA to do that. So um, I just hope that if we keep telling the truth, the truth has a way of taking hold because it has the advantage of being the truth. So eventually I, I was really taken with what the psychologist, I think his name is Matthias Desmet, was saying about how totalitarianism takes hold when the minority groups stop speaking out because then there's that vacuum that it just sucks into and then there's nothing else. You know, it's really important that, that the kind of people that disagree keep dissenting, keep speaking up, keep publishing, keep doing interviews. So when people are ready to listen, there's something out there. So that kind of buoyed me because I was feeling a bit downbeat towards the end of um, summer just feeling a bit defeated. Um, you know, I've been working in groups that had problems with hackers and all the rest of it. So um, I just felt a bit dispirited about that. And uh, it gave me another kind of reason to go on. It's like, it doesn't matter if the audience is small at the moment, just keep telling the truth. And uh, eventually, hopefully that number will grow as I think it is. I, I, my sense is more and more people are waking up and joining the dots. So 
I think it is important that everyone carries on, you know, the fight because it's a psychological war. It's not with bullets and guns as it would normally be. It's just all being kind of done in people's minds, which is really insidious. It's hard to get hold of, you know. Yeah, it is. And, um, you know, there is this kind of idea out there that's quite prevalent, which is just that we're all expected to kind of trust the experts and, you know, don't worry about it. Don't don't think, don't um, do your own research. I saw an article recently and it said something about like, why why critical thinking is not always a good idea or something. And this was a genuine article that was basically saying that don't do critical thinking because, you know, it's 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 really bad. You shouldn't do that. Just just don't worry about it and trust the experts. And actually, you know, we're not willing to do that because there's there's more to this than what experts can even talk about. Because, you know, regardless of the fact that you can buy science just as much as you can buy politics and that when it's very clear that the scientists have been wrong and wrong and wrong again and again and again, whereas the kind of quote unquote conspiracy theorists have been correct um, time and time again. But aside from this, um, it's not necessarily um, a question of science anyway. It's actually a question of principle and kind of core um, values, right? Because even if you could say, um, you know, uh, more lives would be saved by this than that, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing to do, right? Like, you know, you could make similar um, assertions with other things, Um but it doesn't mean it's the right thing to do, right? Even if you can say, okay, well, you know, you're going to save more people by vaccinating children and all the rest of it. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. Previously to now had always been voluntary. And I know that they will like to kind of bring up, uh, you know, yellow fever and all of this kind of nonsense, which you take literally five minutes to deconstruct that argument. So yes. I'm not going to bother doing it, doing it <laughs> right now. Um, but, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's always been voluntary before now. And now they're saying, well, it's no longer voluntary, you've got to do it. And, um, you know, even though they consider voluntary to be okay, well, you can't feed your family otherwise, but it's still you get a choice, which is obviously nonsense. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. Yeah, and actually, I think, you know, you can argue, but I've, I've foolishly got into sort of science debates with um, friends, which it is a, a road to nowhere because, you know, I can look at their sources and just go, oh my goodness, it's from this journal that's largely wouldn't exist without funding from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Of course, they're going to say what Bill and Melinda Gates want them to say. You know, it, to me, that's dead science, these kind of journals that are pushing out this stuff. Um, and you just go down rabbit holes of science. You're right. You don't need to talk about science. You just need to talk about basic principles. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. It's not hard. It's not the right thing to do. And no, nobody should be fooled into thinking it is. And I, and I really worry that with the nudge tactics of 20 months, that people have been led into thinking that that is a, a thing that could even be on the table. I mean, it's so obvious to me that that should not be on the table. You know, this thing should be a choice. Um, the, I mean, the NHS thing is is so beyond absurd. If, if, people, if that doesn't wake people up, so you spend the first six months clapping people at eight o'clock on a Thursday, heroes, et cetera, and then they mandate for a, a vaccine for a virus any frontline staff person has come into contact with in the last, you know, two years. It's endemic, you know. Um, they they are probably the most naturally immune people out there because they've come into contact with it so much. And now you're going to say to them... This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. Otherwise you lose your job. I mean... To me, that that was a, a real kind of like, surely this is going to wake up a few people. And I think perhaps it has, but not anywhere near the outcry that I would expect from these um, so-called heroes that everyone was clapping. And, and now you don't mind if they're fired, if they don't want to go along with the rules. You know, it's a very sort of sinister move towards, I would say, 
a kind of groupthink totalitarianism, because to me, that's what it is. It's a very clear shift towards that kind of um, ideology. Um, and it, it does worry me because it's almost like people are forgetting and you try to bring those points and there's a sort of, you know, glazed look, almost like hypnosis. That's what it feels like. Um so, yeah, I, I completely agree. We don't need to talk about the, the science. We just need to talk about basic principles. And that's why that's why Nuremberg was set up. That's why that code exists. You know, and uh, I saw rather worryingly the EU um, van der Leyen saying perhaps we should just abolish it because <laughs> it's getting in the way. <laughs> Like, yeah, like as as if it was just written for a laugh, as if it was just like, written like, yeah, we just, yeah, it's just just this document sitting around. We frame it and put it on. Just the- chucked it on the back of an envelope. Yeah, you know, just get rid of it. This is the document that's written by people who are like, okay, if we're serious about never again, this is a timeless document, right? This is just this is so it's it's like it's like um. Yeah, it's just such an undeniable truth that that shouldn't be violated. And the ways they're trying to get around this thing, I mean, some of the weird interpretations of it that I've seen when people, you know, I saw this this fact checker the other day and they've been like, we've fact checked it and don't worry, it's okay. Like, it's not a breach of the Nuremberg Code. And I'm like, okay, okay, fact checker. Like, okay, fact checker is like the new okay <laughs> boomer. <laughs> Sorry, in case you remind me. Oh, I see. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then... Um, so I, I looked at this thing and it's, you know, it's, it's basically saying, oh, well, these things uh, went through clinical trials, so it's okay. And it's like the, the Nuremberg Code does not state that, it, that if it's been through a clinical trial that it's okay. The Nuremberg Code is very clear. It's like you can't have a me- medical intervention without your consent. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't say, oh, but by the way, if the FDA's done this and, you know, it's no, um, they, no there are no, there are no amendments to the Nuremberg to Code. Exactly. And there has to be informed consent and no coercion specifically you know and you are just trampling all over those by and you know i just i really don't know how you kind of end up living with yourself if you do fundamentally sort of disagree but you just end up going along with it because it's just going to make your job difficult or whatever to be the one piping up it's like my brain is the sort of thing that goes yeah but if i don't speak up now pretty sure that's not going to be the only thing they're asking for you know it, it you don't get these kind of um, machines just stopping at one thing, you know, it's like, and then there'll be another, and then there'll be another, and then this, and then this, and then, you know, where else does it end when the state effectively legitimately owns your body? That That's what this looks like. And to me, that's an absolute, it's an absolute no uh, for me, for my family, you know, wh- whatever we have to do to, um, to uphold that, you know, and when I hear the kind of, oh, yeah, but you won't be able to go on holiday, I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's not a good reason to have a medical, um, you know, to have a medical intervention. I'm quite happy to uh, go to, uh, I don't know, the Lake Dist- District for a few years while you guys figure this out. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. It seems so crazy to me that so many people, because I would say that like the vast majority of people who have taken this jab is because they want some, whatever it is, you know, some freedom, you know, to the ability to travel or the ability, you know, e- even sometimes it's just social pressure or whatever, but very few have actually taken it because they're like, oh, I'm, I'm concerned about this disease. And, you know, there are some, don't get me wrong, but they're a, ver- they're a very small minority in my view. And I just can't imagine going through that process. I cannot imagine letting the state inject me in order to have my freedoms. That would, it would break me inside. It would, I would never forgive myself for allowing that to happen. And I feel like a lot of people in the freedom movement feel that exact same complete repulsion to this concept. Um, and I just don't understand how everyone doesn't have that. Same. And I don't know, I, I think it is types, isn't it? It's kind of, I'm slightly belligerent, I suppose, but also it's just in doing that, you have lost your freedom already. It's done. It's finished. So whatever comes next is too late because you've already made that deal, you know. So the minute you start negotiating with terrorists, it's over, you know. So it's it's that whole thing. It's just, it's just two weeks. It's just, I think... Um, uh, someone did it. I think Mark Mark Dolan did it the other day. A nice um, two minute thing. All the it's just of the last twenty months, 
And side by side is incredibly powerful because you realise what people have been conned into giving up by a rogue government for a series of governments. Um, because they're not theirs to take away. You don't get to say whether, whether I see my family or my friends or have Christmas or, oh, we might have to cancel Christmas. What? <laughs> like, yeah. You don't get to do that. You know, Christmas is going to come and go. I, I genuinely view this government now um, as illegitimate. I mean, I, there's no part of me that um, has any kind of, not not respect, but just, I don't view them as a legitimate entity. As far as I'm concerned, there's been so they've gone so far and away beyond what a government should be doing, and they're basically now just these kind of um, bullies, which are just fueling hate and dividing people and trying to take away fundamental freedoms. I mean, I've not seen them do anything that a government actually is supposed to be doing in about two years. I mean, it, literally everything has just been about trying to bully people to get jabs. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, like a long time ago, they became completely illegitimate. And this is why I like having conversations like like this now, because we've got to start just forming alternative communities where we reject outright, when we completely opt out and we just say, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm not even going to listen to what you say. There's no point in, in me, you know, figuring out what the latest freedom is that I'm allowed to do. It's just like, this is an irrelevancy. You know, you just have to try and craft a life outside of it and try to do your best to form communities with people to be able to uphold your fundamental freedoms. Absolutely. And I can't imagine anything more depressing than trying to participate in the life that they're offering in this abusive way. You know, they're abusive. And, you know, this notion that but everywhere's doing it, so it must be fine. It's like, no, 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 no. That's not how this works. You know, it's like that, you know, your mum used to say when you were a kid, if everyone was putting their hand in the fire, would you do it too? It's like, well, no, obviously. So just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean I'm going to just go along with it too. And, you know, it, it is just kind of trying to work out how to stay sane and get through it and what the most uh, constructive thing to do and actually – you know, I think early on in the whole thing, I did you know, had, had some time on my hands with all the lockdowns um, and um, when we weren't trying to pretend to homeschool and things like that. Um, and I did get interested in the financial stuff as well, because um, I was watching this kind of money printing thing going on all of a sudden. And I'm thinking this is a very, very strange reaction to a fairly unremarkable virus. Why are they doing this? And then I became, that's when I started to become suspicious, actually. It was the financial stuff. And, you know, they always say follow the money. And I think gen, genuinely that's that's usually a good thing to do because then I started to try and piece together what the real plan is. Okay, why are they doing this? Why is um, COVID the distraction when really I think what's going on is something to do with the financial system? So then starting to read about that and, um, you know, the, the fact that we were in dire straits in the whole fiat currency, um, the way that works, the debt system, and then becoming quite kind of um, puzzled as to why we's, we've accepted this as our way of um, dealing money with each other, you know. How come you get to create money and then charge me for it? That's a weird setup. I, I don't remember agreeing to this, you know. So I just became much more interested in it's like when you start pulling at threads, everything starts to kind of link together, you know. You start questioning that, you start questioning the, the healthcare system, you start questioning the education system as well. I start to realize actually they just go to school and get programmed to think absolute nonsense that's completely useless after they leave school. So then having to have a thought about, you know, what kind of human beings do I want my children to turn into free thinkers is the answer. Um, critical thinkers, um, people that can problem solve, um, people that aren't going to be bullied by by adults who who um, think that they have power over them, you know. Um, so you just have to. It's been a kind of like I think someone told me apocalypse means um, the un, unveiling or something like that, and it feels like that for me. Things I wasn't thinking about, wasn't aware about at all two years ago everything's back on the table i'm having to re-examine everything that i thought previously to see if it's true you know um and and work out how best to go forward and i think the only thing i can think of is exactly what you say to be building communities of like-minded people who can kind of exist within it you know uh, a system within a system because 
I think at first the fight or flight thing kicks in. You think, is there somewhere else I could go that could be better? Very quickly, it's apparent that this is going on all over the world. So there's nowhere to run to. And, you know, I have heard anecdotes of people moving to Costa Rica or wherever or Mexico and actually being quite miserable because you're detached from your people, anyone you know. Like I have, I've moved country several times. It's extremely tiring um, and stressful, let alone trying to navigate a country with its weird measures and whatever else and you've got no rights there you don't necessarily speak the language you know it it seemed much more sensible to me to stay put and try and um build build our world here with people that understood what was going on and that they were going to say no to it yeah i mean um i do think there are some advantages to um people who are abroad because you know like i like I, I was in Mexico for the first six, well, not the first six months of this, but like until a couple of weeks ago, I was there for six months. I'll be going back again. And uh, I know people out there and in other places like Costa Rica and Brazil. And what a lot of people are focusing on over there is actually trying to set up kind of off-grid communities, which I think is an important piece of this is to kind of take that sovereignty to, to the next level uh, in terms of owning the land that you're on, you know, owning... Um, a property or multiple properties and having people in the same area either building or or, or moving to the same place in some way and um you know doing things like growing their own food and generating you know electricity or in some way uh collecting water etc and i think that this is going to be a really important part going forward because um with everything that's coming down the line um people especially over here are very very plugged in i mean you can you can get off grid here uh, it can be done but it's not as easy the financial hurdle is way bigger to actually form communities so i do think that a lot of the community building will be done um, in other places um but i completely agree that it's important you know it is going to affect everywhere you know I- i'm under no illusions being in mexico that it's going to come to mexico as well like um, at some point, they're going to try and bring the same stuff in as they have in the rest of the world. I think it'll happen slower. Um, however, I, I, I'm under no illusions that it's it, you know this is a worldwide um, kind of war essentially that's going on. And yeah, I don't think that anyone will necessarily be be safe from it. But certain places do have their advantages because you know you could take the same money that you could buy your, a house in the UK and you could buy a lot of land. Um, somewhere like Mexico or Brazil, and uh, you could you could do some pretty interesting things with that. So, I do think that some interesting things will happen there. But like you said, you know, people have to um, be willing to fight it everywhere because it's nobody's going to escape it. Yeah, I think my my kind of reservations, you know, when I was trying to sort of think it through, like could we move, whatever, the number of sort of things stood out as obstacles just for me in my personal situation because. Once you've got like teenage kids dragging them around on these projects, it's just a whole other piece of this puzzle because I think kids largely need kids, you know, Um, or it's good if they're around other children, you know, it seems like that's a really important part of development. So there was that. Um, And there was also, I, I just, there's something fearful in me about ending up in a foreign country with the shit falling around your ears you know um where actually it seems to me if you're the stranger in a strange land you will be a target you know if if things really do go terribly wrong and i quite like the idea of being in a place where i understand the culture i understand the language i understand the people in a way that i could uh, you know i never would if i was living in mexico or something it would take me years to kind of embed in that culture but i think you're right you know there's a real there's a lot of chatter about the building of um of um you know citadels and this kind of thing that goes on that people want they recognize the system's broken and they want out and I think it will happen in all sorts of ways. And it's going to be quite a, a creative time, actually, of people just building new realities for themselves. So that's quite exciting, I think. And I think if I was younger um, and didn't have like kids the age I have them, then I, I would be much more up for that, you know, just, just going and starting something completely different. But I think it, that feels onerous to me. I feel kind of knackered already. And I, I'm not sure I've got the the energy to pick our lives up dump them somewhere learn to farm learn to be completely self-sufficient as much as being self-sufficient is the ultimate thing i would love to be in terms of the food growing and stuff like that 
um, because I feel a little bit like a sitting duck, you know, they suddenly cut off supply chains or whatever, just to get you your obedience levels up, then that's going to hurt. So it's something I do think about. Um, but I think as well, there's so many things you have to consider at the moment. It can start to be, send you a bit bonkers. So I think partly I'm enjoying these kind of last moments of relative freedom and sanity because I suspect things are going to ramp up into quite a difficult place in the next few years. That would be my my feeling, unless the House of Cards falls and then they don't succeed. It's hard to call it. Yeah. And I've thought about a lot of those things that you mentioned actually as well, like in terms of being in a foreign country when the shit hits the fan and all these kind of things. Like these are thoughts that have definitely gone through my mind. But I'm under no illusions that it's like, you know, for me it's not a, a kind of, okay, I'm escaping to a country and that's it. I'm never returning. And I don't, I guess maybe when I originally made the decision to go there, there was a part of me that was like, okay, I'm getting, I'm getting out, I'm done, you know, um, because at that point, Mexico was relatively, well, was pretty, pretty open and the UK wasn't. Um, But, you know, realistically, you know, I have family here, I have friends here, you know, I'm always going to have the desire to come back to the UK. It's, you can never just completely, it's not like you can just completely shake off your your past and just say okay well that's it i'm done i'm drawing a line like this is just not how uh, relationships work and and how you know humans operate basically so you know even people who are moving you know i think there is a possibility there to kind of build something new and build something interesting in some of these places and that in mexico in particular there does seem to be a lot of people who are moving there especially from canada like there's a lot of canadians now who when the travel ban was coming in in canada and they had a month to leave the country because they couldn't get on a flight anymore. A lot of them came to Mexico and now they're looking to build um, communities in Mexico. And, you know, obviously the rug could be pulled at some point, but, you know, I think the interesting things will happen there. Um, so God, that's so interesting. I'm just thinking about Canada. I just still can't believe it. I just like, so our best mates in Hong Kong were um, Canadian from Vancouver Um, And they're largely going along with everything, which really surprised me because they are quite, you know, strong personality, uh, free thinkers usually. But they just thought, well, I'm not going to be able to travel and so on and so on. Um, And uh, I just watching the extent of what's happened there and how quickly it, it, my, it scrambles my brain. I just can't believe it's happened in Canada, you know, the land of the nice and (laughs) um, that everyone. That's why. Yeah, I think they were easy targets, actually, because they're real, um, you know, uh, social conformists, I would say. And uh, no one wants to not be nice. So the not being nice um, weapon. So if you're a nice person, you won't kill granny and all of that stuff was going to be much easier to pull off in somewhere like Canada, I think. Um, But it's such an odd scenario that you're basically what you're talking about is is people moving out of Canada as kind of refugees that can't stay there because of persecution. I mean, that that's kind of what it is. Can't go on public transport, can't go to school, can't do anything. Um, And that just sounds completely nuts, doesn't it? If you'd have gone back two years, that sounds crazy. But you're right, it is, you know, we do essentially have now refugees from the from the West going to places like uh, Mexico, other places in, in Central America, etc. And um, the interesting thing is right now, it's almost like if you were to call them a refugee, someone would look at give you a funny look and be like, are you, are you crazy? You know, you're exaggerating, etc. But there's no doubt in my mind that if we fast forward 20, 30, 40 years from now, people will look back and they will recognize that they were just as much refugees as anyone else. If your government is basically taking all your rights away and saying you can't go to, you know, I mean, this literally happened in Nazi Germany, right? Like, and we didn't say, we we wouldn't um, kind of say that they weren't refugees, these people who left in the 1930s, you know, in, in the kind of early and mid 1930s from Germany, um, you know, who weren't able to operate businesses, who were having their rights taken away, who were, you know, under com- constant propaganda campaign, who fled to places like America, they were refugees, like, you know, and we all accept that now. I mean, at the time, would they have been considered refugees? I don't know. Maybe we would have called them something different. But certainly, I think that through the lens of history, we all recognize the people leaving these Western countries now are refugees as much as anyone else. Oh, I think you're right. In the fullness of time, everything will become clear. But what I've noticed is an anger in um, in people, if you draw that parallel, because um, so far people haven't been gassed in gas chambers they feel that it's completely impossible to make the comparison between what was happening in the early 
1930s, right? Like it, it didn't start with the gassing. It started somewhere completely different. So, but it seems to make people very, very edgy to draw that parallel. And I wonder if it's because it's hitting some kind of chord of cognitive dissonance where it's like, oh gosh, if I go there, then I'm going to have to examine quite a few other things that I currently believe. Um, but in my mind, you're, you're, you're spot on. It's like, if you're not able to live freely, live your life, you're not able to do the things you want to do, like for example, work, um, then you have no choice but to leave. If you're forced out of a country because of the government, that does qualify for those kind of words you know like refugee status and whatever even though those people may have money um because they come from a richer country um that's not really the point is it they've been forced out of their homeland because of the government so um yeah yeah i, I just i think it's well, it's extraordinary i mean when, when people um say oh well you can't make that comparison you know it's offensive this that and the other i mean at the end of the day, history is never going to look precisely exactly the same. It's almost as if like, what I don't understand under what circumstances you can make these comparisons. If we can't make comparisons when you are segregating society, when people have to share their papers, when you're telling them they can't go and, you know, go to work or they can't go to the store to buy food because the government wants to inject them and they don't want to take an injection. I mean, if you can't draw parallels to that, to something like Nazism, like then as far as I'm concerned, it's impossible to ever make a, a parallel. And I know that people think, I can't remember what it's called, there's some law or whatever, whereby, you know, you kind of, everything always descends into an analogy to to, uh, to Nazism. But in this case, I mean, people were saying, <laughs> I mean, we were making these comparisons way back uh, when they were doing things like lockdowns. And it was like, oh, you know, that's a, you know, that's the kind of thing that Nazis would have done. And, you know, maybe that was a premature time to, to make that comparison. But then, you know, it was testing and then it was masking and then it was this, that and the other. And now we're literally at the point where they're segregating members of society. They're saying you can't work. You know, they're doing lockdowns for the unvaccinated. There's propaganda every single day. Uh, you know, like they're just completely spewing hate. You know, people are, are, are hating the unvaccinated and saying they want them removed from society. And if at this point we're still not able to make the comparison, then I'm afraid that it's impossible, therefore, to, to kind of learn from history. There is no world, there's no reality in which you're ever going to be able to learn from the kind of horrors of 1930s and 1940s Germany if we cannot make that comparison with what's going on now. It, it's impossible. Yeah, I think because for me, I can't see a way in which it could be more similar to the early rollout of, you know, they even called them health passes and things like that, you know. So... Um, I, I just, it's one of the things that baffles me. That's the thing I find so obvious. I can't understand why other people are struggling to make that link. And also to have the imagination that they seem to think that psychopaths uh, and, and crazy despots only belong in the past, as if they could, you know, possibly be be alive and well now and statistically why on earth not of course they would you know they, they've been dotted right throughout history as far back as you want to go so I, I just for me it's it's completely plausible that there is malign people evil people that want to do very very bad things um, and we should be watchful for that because it seems to be looking at what's going on that they might be um, out of their kind of sleeper cells and and very much active. So, um, yeah, I I really do not subscribe to the kind of um, just opportunism that some people think is just opportunistic, like corporate opportunism. I, it just doesn't fit all of the evidence for me. Um, you know, when you put it in its entirety, and as you say, some of these kind of symbolic things that just seem utterly bizarre, like where it's popping up and how they're managing to manoeuvre that and that kind of thing. And it, it, I don't, I don't tend to see it as an accident at all. Um, so I just think we we need to kind of somehow um, learn how to communicate with each other again. Are finding it very difficult to communicate with the other side let's call it um because we just we meet nowhere in the middle you know there's no middle ground and i think there are some things you can't agree to disagree on and it turns out this is one of them you know it's not like you can be a fascist and i can be against fascism and we can just be friends you know <laughs> like i just can't um i can't bend to that so that's a kind of that is a divide and conquer because we can't remain in a relationship that's meaningful, friendship, whatever, if you don't understand that that's fundamentally wrong. That's kind of where I've got to now. Um, 
which is difficult and painful. And often you lose people actually in your life because it's just too painful to keep going back for more, you know. Um, but I think the, the only thing I think about that is this is not static. It's changing so fast. And eventually I think it will become very obvious what's really going on. And, and hopefully those relationships can be sort of rebuilt later down the line when it's a bit more obvious. I hope so as well. Um, I just hope that there is actually some kind of personal introspection that goes on with these people who have advocated for some of these things, because, you know, I know that I have lost at least one good friendship over this um, because, you know, he was espousing views, which, um, you know, for like from my point of view, were fascist views, um, you know, essentially um, kind of giving, essentially forgiving. How do I turn this? essentially being okay with um people who aren't vaccinated having their rights taken away and kind of saying this to me you know quite um placidly you know just uh, as, as if this is something that i would just kind of like accept like oh, okay cool that's that's just an opinion you have and you know unfortunately that's just such a reprehensible view that it's just impossible for me to i'm not going to entertain it you know and as far as i'm concerned that you can't have a friendship where you know, it's, it's like for me it's, it's like if you find out someone's a racist like if, if you're if you're friends with someone and um you find out that they you know are a racist like it, it completely it fundamentally changes your relationship with that person you know that 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 changes the nature of their character in a way that you can never quite trust them on the same level etc and um you know equally someone who says oh well you know someone who decides not to take the vaccine they should have you know the, like I know that the media um, would uh, is trying to kind of normalize this as just like oh this is a perfectly okay view to have, but you know it's not going to be normalized. It's certainly not going to be normalized by me. Anyone who um, holds this opinion, in my view, um, they're not deserving of my friendship. And you know um, I think a lot of people have have had to make those um, unfortunate decisions with their some of their per personal relationships, and it is sad. But you know when we're going through difficult times, you know you need your you need your friends and you need your your family you or, or not necessarily that you need them but you expect them to ally on some fundamental core principles and you know unfortunately um this kind of covid um hysteria has really brought out the character in a lot of people and it's not always the character that you hoped or expected to see from them but um you know you have to do your best to act upon that new information uh, in a way that's kind of congruent with your beliefs yeah, and I think it's important as well. I think once you frame the whole thing as a war, which I believe we are right, you know, we're probably not even in the beginning bits of, of watching this play out, but it is a war. It's a war on our freedoms, our way of life, you know, everything. Um, then you have to start kind of going into self-preservation mode a bit. And what I was noticing is like it was costing me days of feeling really awful to have these kind of um altercations with really you know people that really matter to me i don't care what everybody thinks but people that are very close friends i found it deeply upsetting you know and then you realize that in a period like this sometimes you have to let these things go because you can't keep you know punching yourself in the face repeatedly it's like you're you're part of this kind of abusive setup then again it's it's this kind of system of abuse the government's abusing them and you're getting into this awful setup with with them too so it's 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 just taking the energy out of there and putting it somewhere more constructive and that feels more positive and that is building something good rather than um trying to you know just bang the head against the wall with something in a situation where the, the other person has no desire to 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 come and mm, listen to what you have to say or to agree with you and you know i do understand that means that it's kind of bloody minded because i'm not going to change my opinion so the argument there would be you know you have to compromise it's like no <laughs> on yeah, this occasion yeah. no i don't that's not going to exactly. happen yeah there, there is there really is no no compromise to be had by some of these view, views and no matter how much like i said no matter how much the government and the media they try to normalize it um it will never be normalized for me and i think that it is fair and it's you know that is actually treating yourself with um kind of self-respect and you know upholding your own values is to accept that you know it doesn't matter how close someone is to you if they're holding views which are completely reprehensible um you know you have to um make a decision to sometimes 
say, well, you know, this is this is no longer a relationship I can sustain. And I think that, you know, everyone who's in who's in our position, and I'm sure there'll be people who listen to this who are in that similar position, I'm sure that they'll be able to relate. But, um, you know, I do think that it's the right thing because, you know, we have to stand up for the values that we believe in. Otherwise, you know, what's the point? Yeah, exactly. And it's, you know, the what, what world do you want to build? Um, I definitely need to be able to look my kids in the eye later and and say that, you know, we did everything we could to try and fight for their rights and their freedoms to live their life as they, as they see fit, you know, outside of these bizarre narratives that are being pushed on them. And you can see in their, in their generation, they're so confused because it doesn't really make a lot of sense, some of the things they're being told. And kids have a fantastic sense for truth, actually. They can sort of smell BS from from a long way away. So, you know, for a lot of it that isn't resonating, that they're being told, they can see something's up. But unfortunately, that level of confusion really destabilizes kids. And I think that's why you're seeing this explosion in like mental health problems and all the rest of it, because the ground is just moving beneath their feet. And I think us grown-ups need to, you know, just have a word with ourselves and say, right, okay, we need to stop doing this now. Um, and put them first you know a society that is not that is abusing the kids locking them up for weeks at a time shoving things up their nose injecting things that can serve no no purpose you know no benefit to them um, is a very lost society you know if you're treating your kids like that terrorizing them telling them they're going to kill their granny all this stuff this is just child abuse in my view so um all the adults that are going along with that i find it very difficult to hold a position of respect for because we need to band together and say no you know this is this is not okay um and to to kind of overcome your own fear if you have become scared by the government propaganda which is completely understandable but to kind of unpick that and try and sort of return to a, a moral position where you're putting your children first and their needs first because I think that that's that's what a good society does, and that's the sort of society I want to be part of. Could not have said it better myself. Um, yeah, I think that yeah, that was uh, that was really good. So um, that's kind of a good point to uh, start rounding up on. Um, just before we close off, um, I know that you have involvement with Heart and the Together Declaration. So I was hoping that you can just kind of shed a bit of light on what those are, because. I know a little bit about both of them, but I'm not too clued up. So um, I'm hoping you can just go into that a little for me. Yeah, so um, HEART is a group of doctors, scientists, um, psychologists, various professionals that were that sort of came together because they were worried about the narrative and feeling like there was no two sides to it. It was very one dimensional. They thought there was a, a, a lot of problematic science um, in the early days that needed to be looked at and debated. And so they came together largely to sort of have those discussions and try and um, you know, get some of that into the public, the public domain, which is hard because actually I'm sure, you know, you're aware of the level of censorship that's going on. And certainly mainstream media is very unwilling to host those people, to have those debates and to bring people like Sage into the room with people that disagree with them and have those conversations. But nonetheless, these people are really trying to do that. Um, and, you know, um, we produce a weekly bulletin and it has articles in that are looking at some of the inconsistencies in the science narrative. So that's that's heart. And it's it's um, really worth following and reading their articles because they have so many good minds that are contributing. Um, and it's www.heartgroup.org for people that want to kind of go. And it's quite a good one to share with people who are on the fence as well, because, it's you know, it's very kind of. Um, considered science it's not hyperbolic and it's it's just trying to look at it rationally you know um as you might have in 2019 um so um it's 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 really worth having a look at just before you move on to the together declaration um is heart is heart doing anything kind of on the political side of things or is it doing any kind of like lobbying or what's its role politically if if any so well, that was how it started actually in the sense that that's where that's where these people thought that that it would be possible to have conversations and that's definitely happened um but that was harder than we imagined. There wasn't a great appetite amongst many of the political players to hear another side or to really engage with that. There, there was some excellent MPs that, that really have listened and, and really have taken stuff on board. And I think you can easily see who some of those people are because they're speaking up now against things like vaccine passports and stuff like that. 
And I think part of that was being able to have that open science conversation with people saying something different, um, you know, which is really, really important. Otherwise, you feel like everyone's agreeing, you know, like there's this illusion of consensus in the science um, circle, which just doesn't exist. But most of the scientists that are speaking out internationally are being censored within an inch of their life. You know, they're having to rely on Telegram and, and all these kind of bit shoot and back channel type stuff they're certainly not on the BBC or um you know something that everybody in their millions would be watching so um yeah that the initial thought was try and affect change through the, the politics but actually it became obvious that's not really how this is going to work it's got to come from the people that system is not going to save us so um the people have got to request um you know debate and start looking for themselves and start reading in other channels that are not um the bbc you know frankly i think turn the bbc off and never turn it on again if you want to look after your intellect um the same would go for the guardian and many of the other broadsheets you know they've been hijacked by financial interests that are not aligned with truth seeking or even you know, um, reporting on anything in a meaningful way so i see them as like more like ad campaigns for the pharmaceutical industry that's what they've become um so i think it's people need to take their own autonomy understand they're not getting the full picture and then figure out who is giving the full picture and where to find it and that you know that that's what these kind of more um fringe uh, outfits are trying to do is provide a voice that that is not um being heard currently so um yeah that that's kind of where it started but now we we write with the view for the general public to 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 read it and to see what's going on what the scientists are actually saying you know um and i think that voice is getting louder more and more scientists are speaking up more and more scientists are concerned so i think more and more people are all over the world are joining that debate so that that's kind of encouraging i would say yeah and um I do want to get onto the the together declaration, but just while you're on that point about, um, you know, the kind of like censorship of people and things like that, you know, like obviously I've kind of waited to the end to kind of, um, discuss like heart and the, the together declaration, which you are involved in. Like I could have brought that up straight up front and, you know, maybe that would have been useful, but I actually don't think it's too important because, you know, the important thing to me is, the kind of views that you hold and that the views that people uphold and espouse. So I'm concerning myself not that much with, you know, what people's kind of associations are when I'm having these conversations, which is why, you know, we've kind of waited until the end of this conversation to even discuss um, these two organizations. Cause actually, you know, the, it doesn't really matter what your position is. Like the important thing in this community is um, that you have the right fundamental values and that you care about the values of freedom. And that's kind of what this podcast is about. And, um, you know, I don't think that this community and this kind of movement, this this countercultural movement that we're building should have this kind of fetishization, if I can say that word, of um, experts in the same way that the kind of legacy institutions do. Right. Like, I don't I don't think that that we should be be doing this. And I should be like, oh, uh, you know, here's Anna. She's in she's involved with with heart and the together declaration. That's why her views are important. Like, you know, it's it's great that you're involved in these things, but that's not. The important thing the important thing is actually you know having just views that are that are kind of important that need to be heard and that um the values in, are in the right place so i just wanted to inject that in in case i think you know, that's such, I such a such a good point because you know unfortunately institutions are built and then their their kind of their reputation seems to um override people's belief in their own ability to think Oh, well, someone who who studied a thing for a while knows better than I know. You know, anyone can go and learn about anything if they so desire. And now that's not to negate expertise and it's very important and whatever, but it has to be with some humility and um, the ability to look at those things daily. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Am I examining it? Not this kind of almost semi-deity kind of structure that a lot of um, academia seems to have. And I think, you know, some of my early mistrust was from, I worked in, in an ac- academic institution for a couple of years. So watched that whole kind of hierarchical structure and the egos and all the rest of it. And I found it actually quite disquieting because it didn't seem to be a seat of learning. It seemed to be a seat of um, climbing up a, a certain structure, which is maybe a very human thing. But I think we need to have a healthy um, suspicion of everything we're told. And, you know, that old adage, don't trust, verify. I think this is just such a beautiful three words because you need to go and check it. Don't kind of be lazily advocating your thinking to other people. 
go and see if you agree. You know, just I think it's really important that you take responsibility for the things that you're told and whether or not they're true. Don't just parrot them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So actually, you know, the fact is you can be a, a, a doctor or a PhD or any of these things and that doesn't actually say anything about the content of your character. And, you know, again, I'm sorry to kind of hark back and, and bring up Nazi Germany again, but a lot of these people who are doing awful things, they were doctors. And I'm not saying doctors are evil by any stretch of the imagination, but what I'm saying is that it has absolutely no bearing on the content of your character. And, you know, that's why I think that in this community, it doesn't matter who you are. And that is one of the the, th- the, the things which I really like about it is, you know, I don't even know at the background of the people I'm communicating with. Um, the important thing to me is, do they have good values? And, you know, are they... Um, awake to what's going on and um yeah that that's the only important thing so and actually twitter's been um, a really good tool for that actually hasn't it you can kind of get a sense of people and i have met in real life people that i followed you know for quite a long time on twitter first and it's been a real treat because you know you just get a sense of what someone's about and um and I think it, it, you're right. It's. A, it, I think the, the doctors thing is interesting because you could not get an, an, an organisation that is more institutionalising. You know, like you arrive in it, you get told exactly what to think and feel and do from 18. You know, and you never get a chance to really kind of develop your your personhood before you do that. And I think that that you also know that if you step out of line, there's no other employer. So you know, if something's going to keep people obedient, it's that this is a monopolistic organization. And far from being something that I would get out and clap for, I think it needs to be completely restructured so that it's the patient at the center of the care, not the organization. Um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, you make a really good point about doctors. We need to be sort of able to question them and not have that white coat um, effect that, that we feel we can't ask them about things affecting our health. Um, because we should, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I actually, I actually did clap for the NHS, and it's one of the one of one of a great. It's a great regret of mine. Uh, I, it was. It took me a couple of weeks of clapping before I was like, why that? Why am I doing this? This feels weird. And then, uh, and then I, and that was my. That was when I started on down the rabbit hole. But um, anyway, <laughs> that was a whole other conversation. <laughs> um, but yeah, the reason that I kind of shoehorned that whole thing in there was just because, you know, like if anyone actually is listening and has listened to all of my episodes so far, they'll realize there's a theme of me doing the introductions about two minutes before the end. <laughs> and the reason for that is because it actually doesn't matter to me that much. It doesn't matter to me about, you know, association, or, you know, that's not what this podcast is predicated about. But um, thanks so much for sharing that information about heart. Um, because, you know, it is, it is um, great. There's an organization um, out there doing this stuff. And thanks to you for kind of putting in the work and working with heart and because, you know, it, it's super important. Um, you know, we need to be kind of fighting on all fronts. So just before we uh, we kind of do the, the final bits, could you just um, share with us about the te- the Together Declaration as well? Yeah, so I, I'm really keen to, to talk about that because it's my belief that only the public can win this, you know, when they decide enough's enough. If enough people say, we've had enough of this, no thank you. All of the slightly weak-minded MPs and stuff really will have to fall into line. So um, the Together Declaration was set up to bring people together who were against, initially against, you know, the vaccine passports and all that stuff, but they um, are kind of campaigning on seven pillars, you know, um, no vaccines for kids and various, the very, the obvious ones that I think we can all kind of get behind together. Um, And really it's about your freedoms. That's really what this movement is about. And it's really important that we all unite under one umbrella. And I just, I was really struck by um, the the kind of good feeling among the people that were, were leading it. And it is a good energy. They're just good people who are in it for the right reasons, in my view. Um, and I, I really like that kind of um, camaraderie and that sort of teamwork that, they, that was really obvious. Um, and so I just wanted to jump on board and help in any kind of administrative way that I could, you know, with the, with the, these kind of campaign things, it's all a little bit um, fly by the seat of your pants. But um, the more people we can get on board signing it and adhere, and, and kind of um, recognising that those things are important and should be fought for, you know, then I think we're in a better position as a country. You know, we need to 
get lots of people aware that vaccine passports are going to be divisive and really harmful. And then to say no, and particularly businesses, because businesses are what they are going to use, I think, as the linchpin to hold this system of authoritarianism up, you know, scare them with fines and all the rest of the rest of it. And then you have to then you see them implementing them. But if they all said no, that would that would be the end of it. Like you've seen in small places in Italy where they just went, mm, no, sorry, we're all opening our restaurants. And then they open their restaurants. You know, it's about unity so that they can't then focus on one person like you saw happening in Wales where that woman who owns a cinema was just absolutely hammered by police and fines and all the rest of it. Um, even though there was a real lot of support for her, if everybody had stood up, that would never have been able to happen. So it's only when people say, I'm not doing the lockdowns anymore. I'm not closing my business. It's my right to feed my family and earn a living. I'm not doing any of this. And then that's the only time it ends, in my view. Um, so that's why I was really taken to help that, that particular campaign. Yeah, and I really like the name together. Um, you know, that is that that really does say something about what this movement is about. You know, it, even though we've talked a lot, uh, you know, in this conversation and I've talked about it in others, and it's a big topic of conversation in this community is about vaccines and stuff, but this isn't about the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated. There is no distinction there in terms of what our kind of ultimate goals are. It's about, you know, um, it's about tyranny <laughs> versus freedom at the end of the day. You know, it's about, you know, it, the... the the thing that we're against here is mandates and coercion and force and um, segregation, um, not whether people want to voluntarily choose to take a vaccine. So it's important, you know, and I think that the, the name together, the together declaration, you know, really does kind of um, lend to that. So, um, Anna, thanks so much for coming on. This has been a really great conversation. We we could have gone for, for even longer. Um, you know, I, I, feel like, I feel like we could have gone for, for several hours, but um, we have to round it off at some stage. So, um, yeah, really appreciate it. And uh, could you just let people know where they can find you and any other final thoughts that you have? Yeah, I mean, I just go by my own name on Twitter. Um, I think it's Anna Rayner 2020, which is when I joined Twitter, having been um, not interested in social media, particularly before that. Um, and um, yeah, feel free to to follow me, but also uh, the togetherdeclaration.org is a really good one to follow for how to get involved locally, local campaigning, local building local groups. I think we need to start connecting in real life with other humans who feel the same way and then growing it outwards and i think you know like that we can we can do really start to affect change thanks so much thanks so much for having me